I wonder how many of you have ever been deceived, where you've been tricked, or whether you've been cheated out of something. And chances are, if you have been deceived, when you found out, you were probably pretty upset. I'll never forget a a story that I once heard. We had a a chapel speaker at the seminary I went to in in Dallas named Tom Landry. Any of you know the name Tom Landry? Uh, Tom Landry was the the coach of the Dallas Cowboys, and he was on the board of the, of the seminary that I went to in Dallas. And uh, Tom was not the most inspiring speaker, but Tom had the best football stories. And the one football story I remember, and it relates to this whole idea about deception, was uh, he was talking about one of the most courageous football players he had ever coached, and his name was Walt Garrison. I don't know how many of you remember Walt Garrison, but... Walt Garrison was not only a Dallas Cowboy, he was a real-life Cowboy as well. And when Walt was a a rookie running back, um, they were playing the Chicago Bears. And they had a a kind of a a trick play where um, there was some deception going on, and then Garrison would come out of the backfield, and he made a really, really long play. And finally he got tackled, and... When he got up, or as he was getting up, uh, Dick Butkus, the linebacker for the Chicago Bears, looked down at him and he said, Rookie, if you ever try that play again, I'm going to bite your head off. And Garrison got up, dusted himself off, and looked up at Dick Butkus and said, Well, sir, if you bite my head off, you'll have more brains in your stomach than you do in your head. (laughs) That was kind of a gutsy thing to say to... Dick Buck, especially knowing you're going to play against him the rest of the game. In football, there are such things as trick plays, deceptive plays. In fact, that's often what needs to be done to score touchdowns, to make yards, and to be successful as a team. Well, as believers in Jesus Christ, we have a spiritual enemy who specializes in deception. And Satan is called the father of lies. And he seeks to rob us of the life that God intends for us and to lead us down a path of destruction. I don't know if you've ever thought about it, but our our decisions determine our destiny. And since this is true, how can we keep from being deceived into making wrong choices? Well, the best way to avoid being deceived by Satan's lies is to know and apply the truth of God's word. I once heard that... um, when Treasury uh, officials are being taught how to identify counterfeit bills, they don't give them all different kinds of counterfeit bills, but they teach them to study and to examine genuine currency, to know what it looks like, to know what genuine dollar bills look like, so they can identify the counterfeit. And I think that's true as well in spiritual life. Um, I think it can be helpful to know about cults, to know about false teaching, But to really be able to make good choices and not be deceived, we need to know the truth. We need to take the time to study God's Word. And we've been doing that the past few months in the book of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, the first book of the New Testament. And we've been looking specifically at Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And in this sermon, Jesus is showing us how God's way is radically different from popular religion both in his day and and today as well. The beginning of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, and we started with the Beatitudes, where he was contrasting the character of those who are part of the kingdom with the character of those in the world. And he was revealing God's holy standard in the Old Testament law. And then he talked about the importance of speaking the truth and of loving our enemies. And then in the second chapter of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6, he He uh, dealt with religious practices, things like giving and prayer and fasting and and storing up treasures. And he again was contrasting God's way with with the way of the world. And then in the final chapter of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7, he began by warning us against hypocritical judging and the importance of continually asking and seeking and knocking. Well, that's where we left off. That's where we're picking up today is in Matthew chapter 7. So if you have your Bible, turn with me to Matthew 7, starting in verse 13. And here he warns us against what will keep us from entering the kingdom of heaven. 
It says, enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the road broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who go through it. How narrow is the gate and how difficult the road that leads to life and few find it. Be on your guard against false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravaging wolves. You'll recognize them by their fruit. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? In the same way, every good tree produces good fruit, but a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree can't produce bad fruit, neither can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that doesn't produce good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So you'll recognize them by their fruit. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name, drive out demons in your name, and do many miracles in your name? Then I will announce to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you lawbreakers. There are at least three things that can deceive us. First of all, he tells us we can be deceived by the world in verse 13 and 14. And and he tells us that instead of following after the world, instead of going the way of the majority, we need to choose the narrow over the broad. In these verses, he talks about the fact that there are only two gates. There are only two roads or two ways and two destinations. There's, There's really no gray area. And and I know that's hard today because narrow is not a word that most of us would want to be characterized as. I don't know if you were given the opportunity to describe yourself in four or five words if narrow would be one that you'd pick. Anybody, would that come to the top of your list? Narrow, yeah, I'm narrow. That sounds terrible. That sounds awful today. In In a world where the greatest value is tolerance and being inclusive, in our pluralistic society where everything's okay, and basically you do what you feel like doing, to call yourself narrow seems restrictive. It seems negative. It seems, it seems bigoted and wrong. But Jesus didn't worry about how people characterized him. He said there is one way, and it's a, it's a narrow way. He said the only way to God is through him. In John 14, 6, He told it this way. He said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Think about that for a minute. How does that sit with our popular culture? If you were to say Jesus is the only way, in other words, all these other religions are wrong. Whether it's Buddhism, whether it's um, uh, Hinduism, whether it's Islam, These things are not the way to the Father. That Jesus is the only way. What would happen to you? You, Well, for one thing, you probably wouldn't get elected to political office. At least not in a lot of places. Another thing is people probably wouldn't listen to you. If you had a business, they'd probably protest your business. But Jesus made it very clear that I am the way, the truth, and the life. Not a way, not a truth, not a life but the way, the truth, the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. As Luke was writing the book of Acts, in Acts 4.12, he said it this way, There is salvation in no one else. He's speaking of Jesus. For there is no other name under heaven given to people by which we must be saved. We can't be saved from eternal punishment. We can't be saved from hell in the name of anyone else other than Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As we continue on and look at this, at this passage and look at these sections where he talks about entering through the narrow gate and he says the gate is wide and the road broad that leads to destruction. There are many who go through it, but how narrow is the gate and difficult the road that leads to life and few find it. He, he starts by talking about a wide gate, a, a broad gate, a big gate. And what does it lead to? That gate opens up to a a road that's broad and and easy to walk down. And he's saying here that it's easy to follow the crowd through human religion, through human philosophies, whether it be self-effort or whether it be good deeds, whether it be earning your way. And, And I think in context he's talking about the Jewish leaders of his day, the Pharisees that they had a whole system of rules and regulations in order to 
gain approval and gain acceptance from God. And he's saying that's the wide gate and it leads to a broad road. But the final destination is destruction. It's hell. And then he contrasts that with the only other alternative, the the narrow gate and and the difficult road. What is the, the narrow gate and the difficult road? It's Repentance from sin and self-effort and trust in Jesus Christ. Believing in Him for our life. Trusting in His sacrificial death and in His resurrection. You see, faith in Jesus is the gate. That when we trust in Him, we've entered into life. And that leads to a, a road, the life of discipleship. And the final destination is an eternal home on the new heaven and the new earth. One thing that's kind of troubling to me is, is he says that there are definitely more going the way of destruction than the way of life. He says how narrow is the gate and difficult the road that leads to life, and few find it. You know, truth isn't determined by the majority. I don't know how many times I've seen something on the news and it'll, you know, talk about maybe... Um, someone that's been accused of a crime or something, and they'll say, well, the poll says 82% think he's guilty. And I thought, what in the world does that matter? Does it really matter what 82% or 90% or 99% matter? Or what's true? What's true is what matters. It doesn't matter what the polls say or what percentages say or what the odds are. I remember hearing an evangelist one time, and I I mean, I I guess there was a point to this, but he talked about the percentage of people that come to Jesus Christ before they're 20 and after they're 50 and after they're 70. And he basically said the percentage is, if you're over 70, it's like 5% chance that you're going to accept Christ. I thought, good grief, really? Do we base salvation on odds? Do we... Decide who we're going to preach to. Well, let's see, this person, odds are he's not going to accept the message, so I'm not going to talk to him. That's ridiculous. But that's unfortunately the way some people think. Jesus said it's true, though, that there are few that are going to find it. And why is that? Why do you think people will have a hard time choosing the narrow gate and, and the path to life? I think it's because basically we're prideful. We will not humbly receive what Jesus did. That on our own we won't come to him. That God's spirit must be working in us. Must be convicting us of our sin and convincing us of our need for a savior. Because if we think we're good on our own, if we think we're good enough or better than the next guy, if we have this this deception that we bought into that somehow God's going to just say, okay, I'll let you in apart from what you do with Jesus, we're deceived. We're sadly mistaken. So in application, the most important question you could ever ask or answer is, which gate have you chosen? It's the most important decision you'll ever make because it isn't a decision about what's going to happen to you in the next week or in the next month or even in the next 20 years. It's a decision that will determine where you spend your final destiny, your forever and ever. In this picture that Jesus gives, there's really three aspects to this path to life or to this kingdom living. And one of them's past, one of them's present, and one of them's future. The past is an act. That's when we trust in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, where we enter through the gate. The second part of it is the road that we're on, the present process of growth, that we grow in righteous character after we've put our faith in Jesus and we live a kingdom lifestyle through discipleship. That's the road or that's the way. And then there's a final destination, that's future glory. That's when we become perfected in righteousness, when Jesus returns, when we receive our resurrected, glorified body and live forever in our eternal home. We've reached our our final destination. And it all begins by a decision. A decision to enter the right gate. 
You can't enter the wrong gate and get on the right path that leads to the right destination. You have to enter into the right gate, and that's Jesus. He then goes on to say, not only can we uh, be deceived by the world and the majority, we can be deceived by false teaching. In verses 15 to 20, he, he tells us we're to be on guard against false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravaging wolves. We need to be careful whose teaching we follow. Just as there were many false prophets in Jesus' day, there's an abundance of false teaching today, even in churches. All you have to do is go on the internet and and look up um, something about heaven or how to get to heaven or something about religious teaching, and you can find all kinds of things that are just really wacko, uh, really crazy. But then you can find some that label themselves as Bible-believing Christian churches, and there's error sometimes that you can find there as well. And so I think we have to be very careful. We have to take Jesus' words to heart that we have to be on guard against false prophets. We're warned against those who seem to be religious teachers or spokesmen for God because Satan uses deception. Listen to what the Apostle Paul wrote to his young disciple Timothy in 1 Timothy 4, 1 and 2. It says, Now the Spirit explicitly says that in later times some will depart from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and the teachings of demons through the hypocrisy of liars whose consciences are seared. Over and over again in the New Testament, we're told to be careful of false teaching, to watch out for the wolves in sheep's clothing. One thing I I think we need to know to not go to the other extreme is to realize that not all false teaching is intentional deception. Um, Some comes from ignorance. Uh, Some comes from error. Some comes from a lack of study or influence from incorrect sources. So uh, my, my thought here, my counsel here is when you disagree with someone on some point, especially if it's a minor point of, of doctrine, say something about um, is Jesus coming back before the tribulation or after, and if someone disagrees with you, you say, false prophet, you're a wolf in sheep's clothing. I think that's going to an extreme. I think we need to realize that we're all fallen, we all have make mistakes, we all might be influenced by something we've read or something we've heard, and we might talk about it, and we're just wrong. It doesn't mean we're trying to be deceptive. It doesn't mean that we're a, a false prophet. It's when we declare it as the Word of God, or we say, I've got a message from God, and it goes against Scripture, that's wrong. And we know that that's wrong. False teachers, Jesus said, are recognized by their fruit. And you know, it seems to be in this passage that he's trying to make it perfectly clear so you can identify immediately false teachers. Well, the problem is, what is fruit? And that was something that I kind of struggled with as I prepared this message because fruit is used a lot of ways in the Bible. Obviously, it's used of literal produce that comes from a plant. And Jesus isn't talking about the fact that, you know, you listen to a false prophet and apples and oranges start growing off his arms or coming out of his mouth. Obviously, he's not talking about that. It's a, it's a figure of speech. So what is the fruit? Well, one thing fruit is talking about is offspring. So it, it could be their followers, their disciples. What do these teachers produce in the ones that follow them? That's one way fruit could be understood. Uh, Another one, and this one's probably the most popular, is that it's the uh, result of their actions, what they do, the the result of that. Uh, Another um, definition of fruit is righteous deeds or character. Like in Galatians 5, it talks about the fruit of the Spirit is love, peace, patience, joy, and so on. That it's the, the fruit that they're producing in their character and in their life. And then a a fourth view is that it's the content of their teaching, that it's their doctrine. Uh, And some of these are are hard to identify. Uh, Some people can can fake 
fruit, can't they? Have you ever seen fake fruit? Have you ever bitten into a wax fruit? Um, I think I have. And it's the same way as we're, we're trying to determine. But the one thing that we can examine objectively is the content of their teaching. Because we have God's word as our guide. And so what are some of the things that we need to look out for? Well, one has to do with the person of Jesus Christ. Um, A false teacher doesn't confess Jesus as Lord or that he has come in the flesh. In 1 Corinthians 12, 3, it says, Therefore I want you to know that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus is cursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So what do they say about Jesus? Do they... Do they say that he is truly God? And also, do they acknowledge that he's truly man, that he's truly human, yet without sin? First John 4, 2, John goes into that. He says, this is how you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. There are some that will say Jesus, uh, Jesus Christ is, is not a person but a consciousness. I don't know if you've heard of that term, Christ consciousness, or the Jesus within. Oprah Winfrey talks about the God within. And that's basically confessing Jesus Christ didn't come in the flesh. He's just a spirit. He's just some kind of force. And John is saying, that's not right. That's not led by the Spirit of God. Uh, Another thing that is a warning and an identification of false teaching is that they teach works salvation or ascetic practices. 1 Timothy 4, 1 to 3, we already looked at the first two verses, but let me just read the whole thing to keep it in context. It says, Now the Spirit explicitly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and the teachings of demons through the hypocrisy of liars whose consciences are seared. They forbid marriage and demand abstinence from foods that God created to be received with gratitude by those who believe and know the truth. So he says, watch out for those that say righteousness means you can only eat certain things. And I'm not talking about dieting counsel. It's okay to give people counsel about dieting. But to, but to say that this determines your, your spiritual condition, whether you eat meat or you don't eat meat or you know, you're on this kind of diet or that kind of diet saying, this is wrong. This is false teaching. Um, Another one is that they disagree with Jesus' teaching promoting godliness. In 1 Timothy 6, 3 and 4, it says, If anyone teaches false doctrine and does not agree with the sound teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ and with the teaching that promotes godliness, he is concerned and he is conceited and understands nothing. In other words, if the teaching denies what Jesus taught, and if it specifically denies what he taught about what godly living looks like, in other words, where they say, you know, it doesn't matter, you can lie or, or you can cheat or, you know, th- those things don't matter, your morality doesn't matter, he's saying that this is false teaching. And then another one is that they see godliness as a way to material gain. 1 Timothy 6.5 says, People whose minds are depraved and deprived of the truth, who imagine that godliness is a way to material gain. Have you ever heard a preacher on TV say that, you know, if you just say it, if you just believe, if you just hold on to this, then you you can have whatever you want. That you can have all these riches, that you can have this, you know, this this beautiful house or this boat or this, this, this big limousine if you just, you know, just believe it. I think that's what this is talking about. That somehow godliness is a way to material gain. That's a sign of false teaching. And then lastly in Revelation it says uh, another sign of false teaching is that they add to or take away from God's word. Revelation 22, 18 and 19 says, I testify to anyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book, Of this prophecy, God will take away his share of the tree of life and of the holy city, which are written about in this book. One of the signs of a cult, besides them having a wrong view of Jesus, is that they have extra books. If you look at any of the cults, they have extra writings that they hold up to be equal to the word of God. And that's a a clear sign that that's that's a false teaching. Because 
we have God's revelation complete right here. That, that we don't have to add extra books to it to, to have God's complete will and to, to know his mind. So I think it's a serious warning for us that we're not to be deceived by false teaching, but rather are to be students of God's word. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Be diligent. It means work hard. Be serious about it. To present yourself to God as one approved. A worker who doesn't need to be ashamed correctly teaching the word of truth. That's our Awana verse. That's our theme verse for Awana because we want the kids to understand that God's word is the basis of how we live. It's the, the gate and it's, and it's the way by listening to and following God's word. The third way that we can be deceived is we can deceive ourselves. And this one is very sobering. It's not one that we talk about a lot, but it's one that I think we need to not neglect, that we can deceive ourselves. He says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name, drive out demons in your name, and do many miracles in your name? Then I'll announce to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you lawbreakers. I don't know about you, but that's kind of scary. It's kind of scary that at the end there will be people that are excited about going to heaven, and Jesus says, sorry, I, I never knew you. Could you imagine what the response would be to that? He said, some that think they're saved are not. They're deceived. They deceive themselves. They won't enter heaven. It's not based on the vocabulary they use. It's not by them saying, Lord, Lord, look at all that I've done. Not everyone who professes to have eternal life possesses it. Some just say they have it and they don't. It's also not based on the works they perform, even miraculous works talks about prophesying and casting out demons and performing miracles, these these signs and wonders. He's saying some people that do those things, he doesn't know them. They're they're not going to enter into eternal life. True believers, he says, are those who do God's will and are known by Jesus. Well, what's God's will? I, I, I think if you took all of the commands of the Bible and you said, okay, you got to do all these things to make it to heaven, then we're kind of back to where we were before. We're not going to make it. I don't know about you, but uh, I I don't obey all the commands. Uh, I mess up often. Sometimes I I just forget. Sometimes I do it on purpose. Does that kind of shock you? You ever do that? You ever intentionally do something on purpose that you know is wrong? You have some little morsel of gossip and you think, gosh, I don't need to share this. Yeah, I've got to. And you think, oh, yeah, yeah, that's not right. Or you see somebody in need and you have the ability to help them and you say, no, I don't want to help them. Not only do we mess up and unintentionally not hit the mark, sometimes we do it on purpose. We follow after our our fleshly desires the, the old way. So it it can't be that we perfectly meet up to God's standard because none of us do. In John 6, 40, it's interesting um, that Jesus tells us what God's will is or what the will of the Father is. I can't remember. Yeah, I have it on my slide. I don't know why I don't have it in my notes. For this is the will of my Father that everyone who sees the Son and believes in Him will have eternal life. I'll raise him up on the last day. And then it isn't about our works. It's about the work of Jesus Christ, what he's done. That we recognize him as God, the Son of God, and that he died on the cross for our sins and we put our faith in him. That's the will of the Father. The other response is, I never knew you. What does that mean? That's a person who doesn't have a relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ. I've told this story before, but it kind of relates a little bit with, with Jesus not, not knowing a person. And it's, I don't even think it's true, but it's a funny story, and so I'm going to share it. It's about a guy who was, was learning to pray, and so 
he said uh, to the guy that was discipling him, can I pray about anything? And he said, yeah. And, and he said, really? I can pray about anything. And God will hear me. And he said, yeah. And so the next morning it was really cold and, um, and he was starting up his car and uh, the car wouldn't start. And so he was uh, praying, God, please start my car. Wouldn't start. He kept praying. Wouldn't start. So he went back to his friend and he said, um, it didn't work. And he said, what didn't work? And he said, praying and asking God for something. I, I asked him to start my car and it wouldn't start. And the guy said, oh, okay. Um, is that the first time you prayed this week? Uh, yeah. Have you been spending time with God? Have you, have you been just spending time alone in God's word or just praising him or just acknowledging him in your life? No. Um, even half an hour a week, have you been doing that? No. How about five minutes a week? No. He goes, well, I know what happened. He, he heard your prayer, but he didn't recognize you, and so he started someone else's car. <laughs> Obviously not a true story. I don't think it is. But the point is there are some that claim to know Jesus Christ, but they don't have a relationship. They, they've never really trusted him. They, they've never really developed that kind of uh, communication with him at all. That they, that they maybe really don't know who he is because they don't live in that way at all. The good news is we can know we're safe. We can know we have eternal life. 1 John 5.13 says, I have written these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. God doesn't want you to wonder. God doesn't want you to go home today and say, you know what, I hope I'm not one of those. He says, depart from me. I never knew you. He's saying you can know. And it, it isn't really based upon how you live, it's based on what Jesus did and what he's done for you. Because if you truly have trusted in him, there will be change in your life. There will be fruit. We don't know exactly what the fruit is. We, we can't claim to be able to be fruit inspectors for everyone. But God is. God knows. God knows if there's been a change in your life that you've been born again through trusting in Jesus Christ that you've repented of your sins and you've turned to him in faith. He knows. You can know. This morning we're going to celebrate the Lord's table. And communion really is a, is a visible, tangible reminder of the most important thing in our life. It's not just a religious act. It's not just a ritual. It's a reminder of a person, our Lord Jesus Christ. And so in a few minutes, we're going to pass around bread and also a, um, a tray of cups. And as we eat the bread and we drink the cup, it's to remind us that eternal life is found in Jesus Christ. Not in a religion, not in a, uh, a series of commandments, um, not even understanding correct doctrine. It's found in a person. And the only way that we can know that we have eternal life is by trusting in Him, joining ourselves to Him by faith. I'm going to have the praise team come up, and they're going to share a, a song with us to help us just focus on this thought and prepare our hearts for the Lord's table this morning. <laughs>